Hey y'all, do y'all like it when someone says to you, I promise, I promise. You know, promises are important. Uh, human beings, because we are flawed characters, we break our promises, but we shouldn't. God takes very serious promises and he takes uh, very serious promises you make to him. So when we make a promise uh, to God, we need to keep it. If we fail to keep it, we need to ask for his forgiveness. And that's true also for when we fail to keep a pro promise or even to be dependable and blow it uh, with a friend or family member or work or just whoever. But I want to talk to you all about promises today in the Bible. Now, there's a lot of promises that are made in the Bible. And so I've got some little notes here I want to talk to you from. Um, a promise is... Um, promise because, because it's it means that a hundred percent of the time you'll come through and um, but sometimes what we do with the promises of God or scriptures like Proverbs and things like that is we take them to be promises when that may not be the case so let's talk about that uh, one of the most common mistakes of promises is that we ignore the context that a promise is made in. Here's a great example. Um, you know, God makes a promise to, um, where's a good example? Uh, he makes a promise to Abraham, or Abram. And that's Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now you can put me on hold and get your notebook out and your pen and write these down. Or you can just listen and think about it, come back to it and do that later. Whatever you want to do it. I've got on my gold bracelet today. How noisy it is, I'm sorry. Versus my Pandora bracelets, which are many charms, and yet they're not nearly as noisy. Okay, just try to ignore it, y'all. Alright, <clears throat> and don't ignore context in the Bible. When God makes this promise to Abram, it was um, specific to Abram and or Abraham. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that God is going to give you endless children or house, okay? But what it may be that God is going to give you a um, an inheritance. It just may not be kids, and that inheritance may not be money. It may be a spiritual inheritance from Christ, through Christ, which of course we do have. But that would be a real obvious one about context. Um, another thing that we do that can be a, a really big mistake is... Um, we can choose a promise based on what we want it to say. So we may be like, y'all ever heard of cherry picking? I don't know if that's just a Southern thing or what that is, but you can cherry pick scripture and you shouldn't do that for your own good. And especially if you're providing counsel to other people and um, you don't want to um, pick something and then it'd be completely wrong because you picked a piece of that out so that it sounds like it applies when it doesn't apply. So again, that context needs to be there. Um, here's a good example of one. In Exodus 14, 14, God says, this is a promise that God will fight for you. You need only to be still, right? And we also talked about be still and know that I am the Lord. And there is a huge... Um, promise in that and that God will go forward for you and he will fight for you but then it's not much longer after that that God tells Israel to go forth and conquer um, he says go and fight your enemies because um, he has a plan about how that was all supposed to go down so again you don't just pick this one and ignore that one so that's another one that's that's actually a form of manipulation and we don't ever want to use a promise of the Bible by manipulating it to suit our needs or someone else's needs. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to look for another example of scripture that that might work for. Um, okay, here's a great example. Um, do you know in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 8, 20, where... God says, when two or more are gathered together in my name, I'm there with them. And so we think that that if we get two or three people together and we ask God for something, we're getting it. We're getting it because he said you have to. God has to. We can. And you know, I've heard people say things like that. God has to do that because it's in his word. And he can't go back on his word. You don't tell God what to do whether you're using his word or not. Remember, Satan tried that. That didn't work too good with him and Jesus out in the 40 days in the wilderness. You don't try to use scripture and and uh, twist it in any particular way so it works for you. And especially not to think you can manipulate 
the magnificent, the one and only God of all the universes. No, that's not what we do. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't value in coming together and praying together, because I do believe God honors that. But just don't try to twist it and say, God, I'll have to do what we say. Especially if uh, your motive's wrong. And, and that's one of the biggest things that I want to tell y'all to do, is always check your motive when you look at the promises of God and why you are calling on that promise. What's your motive? You know, God tells us you have not because you ask not and people think that's the end of the verse but it's not he goes on to say or you ask with the wrong motive um, our motive needs to not be what we want our motive needs to be what does god want what does his word tell us that he wants because if we seek out his will and we seek to do his will perfectly not our own will not our own way there's something wrong if you're doing it that way anyway that means you didn't give up your will you didn't give up your way so you need to revisit your relationship with christ your salvation relationship with christ right away if he starts telling God what you want and what um, you expect in return. That's the wrong attitude. That means you're still your own God if you're talking like that. Um, I'm not saying that you can't tell God what's in your heart and what you would like and place it before him, but here's what's better. What if we just sit down with the attitude in the first place and ask God what does he want for our life? What does he want from our day? What does he want when we're ill or injured? What does he want when we're in joy and um, just relishing in the, the, the wealth of this world. And we're like, okay, Lord, I've got all this. What do you want, though? What am I supposed to do with this? Or, Lord, I'm dealing with all this. But what do you want? What are you trying to pull out of all of this? So just remember, check your motive. And also do your homework. Uh, do some research. Look up those scriptures. Remember how I told you, use your concordance in the back of your Bible. Almost every one of them has it. Um, and look up the subject matter. And then look at all those scriptures across the Bible and get a whole picture instead of just cherry picking or, or taking out of context look at that subject like look up a subject of a friend of mine was looking up anger and her anger may have been because of pain and I said well don't just look up the word anger look up the word anger and then look up the word pain or heartbroken brokenhearted anything like that and then read all of it write them all out and then read over all of it and pray and ask God to show you overall all of it what is he trying to say about the anger in your heart is there unforgiveness um, is there pain that you need him to take and you just need to have a good cry with him alone and let go of it and be done with it um, is there some uh, conversation you need to have with people for forgiveness on your side and on theirs so that that pain will go away and that anger sometimes anger is misplaced pain sometimes people who don't feel like they can cry get angry instead that happens to a lot of men because they don't feel like they're allowed to cry so they get angry they, they need an emotional outlet it, it's uh, that's why um, we want to let people express their emotions in a healthy way um, so what else what's another thing um, I've read a, an article that talked about um, confusing a promise, what appears to be a promise, with a principle, meaning God is telling you this is how it should work. It doesn't mean it always does. Perfect example. Y'all heard this one so many times, Proverbs 22, 6, when it says, train a child in the way they shall, go, they shall go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. But how many people have you known that um, they have a child that knew the Lord and they grew up and they truly did grow away. They're a wayward child. Now, we look at the, the prodigal son story and we pray for that, that that child will come back, especially in adulthood, as they understand um, the Lord and life a little better, that they'll remember what how they were raised and the truths that they knew and God will use that to draw them back. That is not a promise. That is a principle of how to raise children. Do you see the difference? So I think it's really important for us to know that there are some things um, that are we have to be careful with how we choose to view promises of the Bible. Are we cherry picking them? Do we have the right motive? Are we trying to manipulate God? Uh, are we looking at a principle that God tells us and trying to turn it into an, ab an absolute a promise? Here are some promises that are absolutes that I would recommend to you and the first one is my absolute favorite one Hebrews 13 5 and also I believe um, Matthew 28 20 um, but definitely Hebrews 13 5 says I will never leave you or forsake you God promises that I promise God says 
I will never leave you or forsake you. So for all the things that you get that are good in this life and you want to know how should you share it, what should you do with it, is it okay to enjoy it? If not, then say, Lord, what would you rather I did with this instead of it be for me? Is it okay for me to enjoy this? Because some things it's not okay and some things it's absolutely okay. And there's other situations in life where you come into injury or illness or disease and you need to know that God is going to walk through that with you and you need to come in and say Lord why is this happening what are you trying to show me in this I know you could heal me but you haven't what is it that you want me to see and I do trust you that you have a bigger overall plan and that you will never leave me and you'll never forsake me you have not forsaken me we live in a fallen state so sin is in the world and so it's going to cause our flesh to have problems and that includes decay and illness and sickness and he sometimes reverses that and sometimes he doesn't. But either way, he is not going to leave us. And we can trust him in it. Even when it's really, really bad. We turn to him and, and we turn to our Christian friends for comfort. Um, but we mainly turn to God for comfort. He's the, the true comforter. Here's another promise. Um, in 1 Corinthians 13, he tells us he promises to provide a way out of temptation. If you've got a temptation, you've got a way out. He promises. I promise, God says, there's a way out. It's whether or not you choose to take it. But I will always provide you a way out of saying no to that sin. It's up to you whether or not you choose to say no to temptation. Here's another one. In James 1, 5, he says um, that he will give us wisdom if we'll ask for it. Right? So you, need, you have a big decision or you don't understand something, especially about the Word of God. If you will ask Him, He will give it to you. Does that mean He'll explain every single thing in the Bible to your point of scholarly understanding? Probably not. But He wants us to know His Word. So if you ask Him for wisdom and to be coupled with knowledge, not just knowledge by itself, but wisdom to know how to apply it, wisdom for life to make good decisions on His behalf and, and for His glory and for following his will absolutely if you ask for that wisdom he says I promise I will give it to you if you ask um, another one is um, he is we uh, accept him as our Lord and Savior he begins a good work in us you know that and he promises he'll finish it in other words you won't have everything all up front I'm, I'm pushing 60 years old and it, I can look back over my 50s, my 40s, my 30s, my 20s, my teens, even into my little elementary years, and I knew God differently in all those decades, very, very differently, and um, he started a work in me very, very young, but it's taken my whole lifetime for him to finish it, um, that's why I think it means to work out your salvation, you're saved from God's wrath the moment you make the decision to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross was for you and you forsake yourself you give up yourself you give up your God being you and you make him your God from that point forward there are things that he will be working out in your life though I mean it doesn't all just boom, everything's you know you get all perfect understanding and a very mature relationship in the Lord and have a very mature understanding of scripture that takes time and God's okay with that um, here's here's the best promise of all. Luke, well, I don't know if it's the best of all. There was overall some really good promises, but Luke 12, 40, he promises he's coming back. He says, do you believe I'm coming back? I am. I promise. And I'm going to add in one more that I just thought of. What about uh, John chapter 14, 1 through 11? In my Father's house, but first of all, he says, trust me, trust also in God. This is Jesus talking. That's him claiming to be God. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't true, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I, not some band of angels watching over me, I will come back and get you and take you to be with me where I am. We know where God is. He says, you know the place to where I'm going. And Philip says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And he says, I am the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And then uh, he says, well, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. That broke Jesus' heart. You know it did. Because he says, Philip, don't you know me? Even though I've been with you all this time, how can you say, show us the Father? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father and knows Him. 
don't you know that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? And at least believe on the miracles themselves. Do you know, we do that, don't we? We say, you know what, Lord, if I manipulate promises and I say certain things, I'm going to get you to um, say, uh, if you'll cure this cancer, then I'll believe you who, who you say you are. Or if you get my kids to come back home or back to the relationship I want, then I'll really believe you. You know, if you will help me take care of bills because this is this is about to take me under, Lord, well, then I'll believe you. Or, oh, Lord, if you will find me the man of my dreams, well, then I'll believe you. Do you know that's just as bad as what Philip did? Show us the Father, then. Then I'll believe you. Y'all, we shouldn't do God that way. We should trust God anyway. And if we have requests about our finances or our relationships or our illnesses or our children or friends, anybody that's, that's anything that's putting a heartache on us god does care about you of course he cares about you and your feelings if he cared enough to die for you he cares about your heart and your feelings all, all of that he cares but there's a bigger picture here the promises of god are about a relationship with him that's for all eternity and his entire overall plan do you know when i went through my divorce and people said well beth don't worry because God's got a plan B. And for people who've been divorced more than once, well, he's got a plan C, D, and E. And they just laugh. And I thought, no. Jesus said, don't do that. And I did anyway. And I just need to ask him to forgive me. And I have. And I've moved on from that because he forgave me. And he says, it's as far as the east is from the west. So when he sees me now, he sees a married person. And he's saying, you know what? Whatever you did before, I don't see it. So don't do it again. So I'm not going to get divorced again. I don't care. I've got a great marriage. But even if I didn't, I'm not doing that again. Okay? And um, so now we're back in good standing, right? Here's the thing we don't want to try to change things around so it fits what we want there's a bigger plan it's not plan a b c or d or e it's god's plan and it's always there and we can jump on board with him at any time he says you know come on i'm waiting for you and i have a plan and you can join me at any time turn away from being your own god and let me be your god and you be my person just like he said to Israel. You know, there's a scripture that says Israel is not all Israel, the nation. It's the people that follow God. Be that person that says, you know what, more than anything, I want to follow you. And whatever promises you have for me, I would love to have them, Lord. But it's all for your glory and your purposes. I'm here for you. I'm your slave. I'm here for whatever you want to use my life for. I give up my life just like you gave up yours. You gave yours for me, I'm giving up mine for you. And boy, you'll have such a better life. Does that mean everything will be perfect? No. Jesus promised it wouldn't. He says that in this world, you're going to have troubles. But be a good cheer, because I've overcome the world. Yay! I'm so excited. Now, do I feel that way all the time? No. Sometimes I have to go to my Christian friends and reach out to you guys. We talk together on the comments. And I have to say, you know what? Today, I am not feeling it. But I know in my head, my heart, my soul, I know the truth of the Word of God. I'm just having emotions right now. And He cares about those emotions. He gave them to you. And sometimes you just may need to say, I need to go with my Christian girlfriends, just get a good hug. Or I need to sit down with my husband and say, Hun, I, need, I have some questions. What do you think of this? It's okay to get advice. It's okay to get encouragement. The best thing in the world to do is get alone with the Word of God and in prayer and say, Lord, I'm hurting. I know that you know what it's like to have a broken heart because you are broken hearted for all those people you already know will never come to faith in you. So you know the pain of a broken heart, Lord. That's where I'm at. Can you help me? Do you know he can? He can always help you. He's promised, I will never leave you. And I have not, and I never will forsake you. I'm always right here when no one else is, you got me. And I'm more powerful than anyone else. So I guess that was my time up time. <laughs> that sure is a phone call I need to go make. I love you guys so much. Rely on the promises of God. Let's study together what they are and what they're not. 
and let's just go with Lord I want your will and any promises that you have made for me I'll accept them and for anything that it's not then I'm okay with that Lord I want what you want I want the will of God in my life because my life is for the Lord it's given up it's given up for the Lord just like he gave up his life for me okay you guys love you so much gotta go it's the end of the day and I gotta go love y'all bye